Welcome to Building the Sales Machine. For those of you who have not been here before, uh, quick introductions and a little overview of how tonight's gonna go. Hopefully you've got a chance to meet some interesting folks, some other sales leaders, some other sales people from the New York startup community uh, before we get started with, with Kiva. Um, I'm Eric Friedman. Uh, I work at Expa, which is a startup studio here in New York uh, and San Francisco, investing in startups and building companies from the ground up. I uh, want to also thank Dave Greenberger, who's at Splash, who all of you used to get your tickets tonight, uh, another great company in New York, and Evan Bartlett at ZocDoc. <clears throat> uh, the three of us have been putting on this event to get sales leaders together to build our own network and for all of you to meet other sales leaders in New York. Some people are hiring, some people are looking for jobs, some people are looking for partnerships, and this is a way we have gotten everybody to come together and actually grow and meet other folks doing the same thing with people building sales machines in New York. I also wanna thank our sponsors. This event's come a long way. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, folks that you see up on the board here, like Archie.io, Scaled, mm -hmm. Drinks from Drizzly, uh, Closer IQ, and cater to me. A big thanks to our sponsors and of course Foursquare for the space. Maybe a round of applause for all of them. We are also going to be doing a couple interesting things tonight. Um, the first thing is we are giving away two tickets to the Sales Hacker Sales Conference in June. Face value somewhere around $800 to $1,000, something like that. Pretty good giveaway. Um, to enter and to get one of these tickets, or two of these tickets for that matter, um, we're asking people to send in their best piece of sales leadership advice into building the sales machine. All of this information and how to enter is gonna be around at buildingthesalesmachine.com. We hope that some of you enter. We wanna give away these tickets to somebody who's thoughtful about the sales space. Um, finally, we're also we're hiring, we're growing our community, we're growing our organization. Uh, we're looking for somebody to help with the building the sales machine community. If anybody's interested in helping us grow, meeting all the people that are here and helping with the events, come up and talk to myself, Dave or Evan um, after the show. And then finally, I wanna thank Kiva Colstein from Handshake who's here tonight. Who I'm gonna sit down and we're gonna talk to. We'll get started. All right. <clears throat> so Kiva, thank you for being here. Uh, obviously, uh, as, as folks know, you recently left uh, your previous role and now you're CRO of Handshake. How is that going? It's going, I'm four days in uh, and so far so good. I mean, I think anytime you get an opportunity to uh, join a company revolutionizing an industry, you jump at that chance, and, and that's what I've gotten the opportunity to do. So, thrilled to be there. Congratulations. Um, as you know, we like to keep things tactical. I'm going to dive in <coughs> with some questions, focus around B2B sales and around enterprise sales. Um, we spent a bunch of time preparing for this, and so I'm going to go into the questions, comments, and uh, different areas that we want to go through. And then towards the end, I'm actually gonna open it up to questions from the audience to make sure you guys are keeping us on track and we're talking about the sales issues you guys wanna hear about. So start thinking about your questions now. Um, so you just started, you're four days in. Let's start with how to build the team that makes up an enterprise sales team. You're starting from the beginning, but how do you start from the beginning when you're like one of the folks in the audience, building an enterprise sales team? Yeah, I think the first thing that, first of all, thank you for having me, and I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I think the first thing that you need to think about is what are you selling and uh, how quickly can you sell it? Uh, and the reason you need to think about that is because the profile of the seller changes depending on the product that you're selling and uh, how much you're asking for it and how long the sales cycle may be. Uh, and so before you begin building your sales team, it's determining the profile of the sales professional. And so you've got different kinds of enterprise sales professionals. You've got um, two people who can look a lot alike on paper, uh, both of whom have sold to the largest companies in the world, enterprise. 
uh, both of whom have sold perhaps to the same companies. Uh, both of them have exceeded their targets. Uh, but one of them expects to close a deal almost every time he or she meets with the client. Uh, the other understands that you need to weave your way through the hierarchy of really complex companies, building influence, building advocacy, building a business case that, uh, that you then take to a very senior executive to close a much bigger deal. Uh, I think you perhaps need both in your enterprise sales organization, but you have to know before you begin which one you're looking for. Let's talk about the first two weeks of training. Somebody comes in, you're in it right now. What does that look like? What's important? And what should they focus on? And what should you focus on as a sales manager in those first one to two weeks? So I think later on we're gonna talk about choreography and how a seller needs to choreograph the entire experience. I think the same is true for the business that you join. Uh, you can't wing training. You can't make it up on the fly. I think the best sales training programs that I've been part of or have built uh, are Navy SEAL style training programs where you're in early and you stay late for the first two weeks uh, and you're moving from eight to nine, nine to 10, 10 to 11, all day, every day. Uh, at night, you're taking home homework and delivering it back the next day. Uh, you are getting certified, if you can, on various things like objection handling and uh, perhaps even the product, if you can, if you can do that that quickly. Um, but really important to get this person out and somewhat productive by week three, which is when ramp really begins. So how do you accelerate that ramp and how do you measure that ramp in the first six months? Right, so, so I think, I think before, before you begin to accelerate the ramp, I think you have to understand what, you're, what you expect of your sales professional during ramp. Right, like how do you, one of the challenges that I think, I'm sorry, I'm not even looking at this side of the room. One of the challenges that I think that we all face as sales leaders is you hire someone in who, who did a good job during the interview process and, and they come in with good experience, but how do you know in their first few months or their first year whether or not they are going to be productive, whether or not they're gonna work out? Um, because I think you want to hire quickly, but also you want to let people go quickly that aren't gonna work out. And so, uh, Determining the KPIs, the key performance indicators that you should be looking for over the course of the first six months is really important. Um, understanding what makes for a productive seller, uh, because ultimately uh, the, the, uh, the way you model your business and the numbers that you deliver to the board are gonna be based in large part on the seller, uh, where they are with regard to their ramp, or if they're fully ramped, multiplied by your expectations for what they should be producing. And so if you've got ramp wrong, meaning that in month four you're expecting this seller to do double the output, um, all of your numbers are wrong. And so getting a really good idea for what ramp should be is important. And then in terms of accelerating the ramp, I think that goes back to sales training and sales enablement. How do you deliver to the seller exactly what they need in month three, in month five, in month seven, to make sure that they have the tools and the resources and the support to be productive. You talked about the two types of sellers that you need. If I could get you to extrapolate a bit on that, which should you hire first, which should you hire second, what's the sequencing of those two types of enterprise sellers? Well again, I think it, I think it to some extent depends on what it is you're selling and, and how much you can afford. And, and the reason I say that is because one is a more transactional seller than the other. Both are selling to large companies. One is selling a, at a lower price point, and so uh, you can imagine just making this up that one of them is selling $50,000 deals, the other one is expected to close $250,000 deals. Uh, you hire the first, perhaps first, because it will fund the second, right? The second takes longer to close, and so while that person is out running a sales cycle that might last six or nine months, getting that $250,000 deal closed, you've got to fund that business, and how do you fund that business uh, with the more junior or more transactional uh, enterprise seller. Is there a thing that stands out for you in particular when you go out to hire a rep? A trait? Yeah, well I think, I think you know, you're looking for raw intelligence, you're looking for sort of intellectual capacity, uh, past performance, but I think the most important thing that differentiates successful sellers from non is grit. Um, where is she? 
There's someone here who wrote a great book on grit. There she is. Um, uh, she's written extensively about grit. I've written blog posts about grit. Um, there have been studies done at Penn around grit. Uh, I think Angela Duckworth. Um, grit is a really difficult characteristic or trait to identify in someone. Um, but if you can, it's, it's, it's I think, the, the, the greatest or the fastest or best predictor of future success. There's actually a great, you know, hiring is really hard. And, um, and finding a gritty sales professional, especially a gritty enterprise sales professional is really hard. Uh, the, the, the easiest, uh, well, I think the, the, the first thing that you run into is did this person who has had lots of success sell gold in a gold rush, if you will, right? Were they successful because the product was just really easy to sell? Uh, the second is are they fat and lazy, right? So there's a great um, uh, part of, how many people have seen Rocky Three? Rocky Three. Um, I know you have. Uh, that's my wife. Um, I make her watch that. In Rocky Three, so Rocky had come up from the ground, right? And, and he was uh, a fighter his whole life. In Rocky Three, there's a great scene where he and Mickey are sitting in Rocky's palatial estate. And it's, uh, it's after Rocky has had the title uh, for a number of years, and, and he's just learned that Mickey has been carrying him. He's been putting him up against lesser fighters uh, in hopes of keeping the title longer. And he turns to Mickey, if you can remember this scene, and he says, Mick, I'm a fraud. How could you do this to me? You made me feel like a fraud. And Mickey says back, well, the worst thing that can happen to a fighter happened to you. You got civilized. Uh, and I think the worst thing that can happen to an enterprise sales professional who's had some success in their career is to get civilized. And so one of the things that we as sales leaders who hire sales professionals need to figure out is, is this person still gritty? Are they willing to roll up their sleeves and get dirty, get into it? Or are they fat and lazy and civilized? Let's talk about something that we spent a bunch of time on, the sales choreography as you put it. How do you set up that choreography and, and maestro that sale? So I, I believe whole, like to my core uh, that a successful seller should choreograph the entire experience. Uh, and what I mean by that is, well, before I do that, before I say that, I think counterintuitively, people think that when you memorize you end up becoming less creative, when actually the opposite is true. If you've memorized your pitch, if you've memorized your deck, uh, your demo, uh, you go in knowing what you want to say about the company you work for, you're freed up to actually be in the moment, right? And actually uh, have a real conversation, dialogue with the person with whom you're meeting, uh, instead of having to think about, well, what do I want to say next? Choreographing the entire experience is doing that on steroids, and so what I mean by that is every single time you touch a customer or prospect, you are potentially impacting the outcome of a deal, positively or negatively, sometimes in a big way, sometimes in a small way, but it gives you the opportunity to impact the outcome of a deal. So, so why not choreograph the experience and think in advance of the things that you'll do if? So let me give you some examples. Uh, it's the morning of your meeting, what are you doing in the lobby of your hotel with the person with whom you're traveling to prepare for the meeting? Uh, how are you assigning parts? Are you running through the deck and demo? Are you determining who's going to answer which question when the question gets asked? Uh, then you are in the lobby of the company you are meeting with, and there's an annual report on the table in front of you. Do you read it? If you read it, which part are you reading? Are you reading the CEO letter to the shareholders? shareholders? Are you reading the 10K? If you're reading the 10K, what specific parts of the 10K are you pulling out that may be useful in your meeting? Then you've got a receptionist there who is um, going to be calling the folks up for you to meet with them. What are you asking of the receptionist? What can that person deliver to you? Then the person comes down to get you and it's the assistant to the person that you're meeting with. What might you be able to glean from that assistant? What questions are you asking that person on the way up the elevator? Or instead of the assistant, it's actually the person who you're meeting with who comes down to get you. But you know there are five other people in the conference room waiting for you. And she asks you to tell you about your company while you're on the elevator ride up. Do you say, hold on a second, I don't want to steal my own thunder. There are five other people waiting for my meeting to begin. So you hold off and don't say anything, or do you begin? 
They ask you if you want coffee. Do you take a walk to the coffee maker with them and ask them questions and talk, chit chat? Or do you say, sure, I'll take a cup of coffee? In other words, and then you get into the meeting and the technology fails. What do you do when that happens? What kinds of questions might you ask? The point is, is that we can keep going throughout the entire sales cycle. The first call, the first voicemail, the second call. Uh, every single time you touch a prospect, you have the opportunity to impact the outcome of a deal. So pay attention and choreograph the experience for yourself. How's that? That's great. Okay. No, I love that. I'm passionate about choreography. How important is the sales software you use for an enterprise sale process? With respect to everyone in here who's selling software to the enterprise sales organizations, uh, I don't think it's that important. I mean, I think that there are some things that we all can use. Uh, LinkedIn is obviously an important one, LinkedIn Navigator, um, Salesforce, of course. Uh, then things like Boomerang, uh, which enables you to send out emails uh, at specific times. Tout app, which enables you to track emails that you're sending out. Beyond that, um, perhaps there are some things that people are using. I'd be curious as, as we get to the Q&A what folks may be using out there. But I think those are four important ones. Can you talk for a, a bit about navigating the complexity of companies that have lots of different hierarchies and the different meetings you can have with different constituents within those companies when you get a really complex organization? Yeah, so I think it begins with, with mapping the organization. So before you get to do anything, and, and we can talk a little bit about how you work together with a sales development rep, um, who is the team of people, how you work alongside a sales ops person, um, who are the team of people who help you think about mapping the organization. Um, but that's the first step, is, is understanding the path to close. Like, who is the person that I ultimately need to convince down the road to buy this thing? And what is my fastest path to get there? Um, but selling in a complex environment to the enterprise is not unlike running for office. Uh, if you think about sort of the, the campaign uh, that we're all watching on TV, it's really hard to spend all of this time meeting with people uh, in hopes that they will vote for you uh, sometime in the future. That's not dissimilar to what we're doing inside of the enterprise. We know that likely there will be very <coughs> few people responsible for making the decision to buy your software or buy your product. And so what you're really doing along the way is building influence, building advocacy, right? So building influence, building advocacy is about getting people to stand up for you when the time comes that that person with authority asks for their advice. Right? So you've got to build influence along the way. You've got to understand who are the people that I need to influence who may be asked their opinion when ultimately this person is going to make a decision. And the other is building a business case. Right? So ROI is really important in selling to the enterprise. Uh, really selling to anybody, but, but selling to the enterprise because ultimately the decision is made on whether or not the value of what you're selling exceeds the cost. Right? And so that's very simply put. But this idea that there is a business case that you need to make to someone around the return on the investment that they can expect to receive as a result of buying your product. Uh, and so while you, take, while you go through that sales cycle or, or you're building influence, building advocacy, and building a business case, what you're ultimately taking to that, I'm sorry, building influence and advocacy, what you're ultimately taking to that, that person who has the authority to buy is the business case for why this makes sense for their company. I'm gonna ask Kiva one last question and then I wanna turn it over to the audience to keep us in check and make sure we're covering the stuff you guys wanna hear about. So start thinking about your questions. Um, what's, the, what's the right way to organize the universe of prospects you have? And this was around the, the calendar. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I it's a, it's, a, it's a big question. It's like the most important question. It's the first thing that a sales organization needs to do. Um, because of course you wanna be going after the clients who are likeliest to buy first. Uh, and so I think pattern recognition is really important. So understanding um, who amongst the prospect universe uh, in terms of sectors or geography is, is likeliest to buy first. But then you can get creative and do things like uh, organizing your prospect universe by fiscal calendar. 
uh, is an example of something that we've done in the past where people tend to buy more in their fourth quarter. So making sure that you understand the fourth quarter of the folks that you're selling to. So you're always selling to companies in their fourth quarter. I'm gonna look out to the audience and if you guys could raise your hands, we'll ask, get some questions answered. So this guy in the blue shirt, and I'll repeat the question. So how do you decide between when, when it's the optimal time to just pick a low hanging fruit or when it's time to really invest in a longer term sales cycle? So the question just to repeat for camera's sake, when do you decide to go after the low hanging fruit or the longer term sales cycle, which might take you a little longer, but maybe be a little larger? I think you have to do both simultaneously. Uh, I don't think there's ever a time you should turn off the spigot on what is funding the business. Uh, and so I've not seen it work great, perhaps it has, and I'd be curious if, if you've seen it work this way, where you start with uh, the largest deals inside the largest enterprise and you move down market. Uh, typically it works the other way. Um, and, and you've got to keep it going. I think companies can make the mistake of turning off the, the smaller deals um, because they believe that they can sell to the large enterprise and they probably can, but, but the sales cycle takes so long, you need to keep the lights on. And so you've got to do both simultaneously. And so I think, you know, without going into detail around the specific uh, company you work for and, and what they're thinking about doing, but I think if you can experiment with a few true enterprise sellers, uh, where you have the luxury to let them kind of have a little bit of leash or runway to close business six or nine months out, that's probably the best way to go. So somebody over here, yeah. Uh, quick question about less of the timing and more of the uh, vertical that a sales team or a sales professional would approach. So, I mean, I've worked for large sales companies, I've worked for small sales companies. When you have two to three sales people expanding to a team of four or five, that's a lot different. When a sales team of 70 or 80 people going to a team of 81. Uh, how would you say is the best way to approach divvying up the prospects or the industries or the uh, 2,000 account, uh, accounts that you have in Salesforce among six salespeople or 10 salespeople or two salespeople or 100 salespeople? Just what's the process that you have that's best give everyone a fair shot at having an equal slice of the pie, be it a senior person or someone just joining the sales team. So if I could synthesize the question, when do you verticalize or how do you divvy up the leads when you're a small team, medium-sized team, or a large-sized team? Exactly. Less so when, but more so how would you say is the best way to give sales professionals all an equal fair shot at getting money in their pocket? Yeah, so I mean, I think you've got to divide your sales organization by, let's say, large, medium, and small, you know, enterprise, mid-market, SMB. Um, so uh, equitable distribution of, of prospects has to happen in the cohort, right? Like, it's, it's not the same if you're a junior seller calling on SMB business versus a very senior seller calling on the Fortune 100. But within the cohort, I think, it is all important to, to equitably distribute territory. And so how do you do that? I mean, I think the first thing that you, can under, that you wanna do is, is you wanna understand total addressable market. So if you look at sort of the enterprise and the companies that are likeliest to buy, what is the total addressable market inside that one company? Right, what do you, what's your first sale and how many additional sales might you have inside that company after that first sale is made? And what is the approximate close rate for your sellers going after businesses like that, right? So you're with me so far? Okay, so now you understand the total addressable market. So let's say, for instance, our average deal size is $100,000. The total addressable market by client is a million dollars, right? So now you've got $900,000 worth of growth opportunity inside an existing client. Uh, and then you know there's a close rate of, I don't know, 20% uh, across the prospect universe uh, in terms of enterprise. And so you multiply that number out across all of the companies that you have your enterprise cohort going after, and you begin to div divide up the number of companies 
with that mathematical equation. So everyone gets the equal amount of total addressable market instead of the equal number of companies. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, based on my own personal experience, I don't believe that vertical selling has worked that well. That said, I do believe that doing, getting smart on the industries that you're calling into is a really important part of the sales process. And so without understanding your product and whether it's best fit for the health care industry versus CPG versus financial services, I can't really say for you, and I think for every company it's slightly different, because that to some extent determines how fair the distribution of prospects may be, right? I guess the, the perspective that I was taking is that your product can be sold into any industry. And if your product can be sold into any industry, then you can equitably distribute a, a total addressable market across your sales force without worrying that this person has all the great accounts because they're focused on healthcare or they're in New York. Does that make sense? So I, I think to some extent you need a little bit of both. Right, I mean, you have to understand whether or not your product is best fit for one particular vertical, and if so, are you giving that one vertical to somebody in greater numbers than somebody else? Go back over here, yeah. How are you training your enterprise sellers to manage their pipeline? How are you training enterprise sellers to manage their pipeline? Uh, well, so I think, let me just think I, on this question for a second. So how am I training enterprise sellers to manage their pipeline? Uh, the first word that comes to mind is closely. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, with the enterprise sellers on their pipe. I've got enterprise sellers who've worked for me or do work for me in the audience and they can uh, probably attest to the fact that I'm asking them a lot of questions uh, every day. I mean, I think the idea here is that you have to be really close to your business. Um, and you have to understand um, what is required to move the ball down the field. And it's not just the ramping seller that should pay attention to KPIs. It's a ramped seller that should be paying attention to KPIs. And so what, I, what we manage our, our enterprise sellers against is having a really good idea for what their early, mid, and late stage pipeline should look like. Easy math says your early stage pipeline should be seven times your target, and mid stage pipeline should be five times your target, and late stage pipeline, which is equal to like, let's say 30, 60 days out, should be three times your, your target. Um, but that's very simple, and, and obviously, you know, it's specific to your business and, and the sales cycle in the business. Um, but then beyond that, uh, sellers are responsible for, uh, for Salesforce hygiene, for, for staying inside of Salesforce, for making sure that the sales stages uh, change as they get new information from their prospects. Uh, and so the KPIs that a seller is responsible for, calls, meetings, opportunities, opportunities that move in terms of sales stage over time, uh, proposals, and then of course close business. Yes, in the red. So kudos to your success. Thank you. What are the numbers that you look at <laughs> in the sales pipeline to instrument <coughs> tracking to see how reps are doing? Is that a good summary? How the, machine is going. Yeah. How, the mach how the machine is going. I think the secret ingredient in a machine is sales ops. And I would say I actually don't do as good a job as I'd like to do in paying as close enough attention to the machine as, as I should. 
and instead I rely heavily on sales ops to put a mirror up to my face uh, and make sure that I'm paying close attention. And so the, the fast answer is, you know, in a world where you have 30 meetings that should result in 10 proposals, that should result in, you know, two deals, and the deal at the average contract value is X, you can manage closely to that. But we all work in more complex environments that, that, than that one, and so some of the things that you need to pay close attention to that I think re are really meaningful is timing. So let me give you an example. In enterprise sales, uh, you will run into procurement, right? And in procurement, you will have to battle on price and battle on terms. Um, depending on the company you work for and the size of the deal that you've proposed, procurement can take a while. And so as an example, just to answer your question, if my seller forecasts a enterprise deal of $200,000 to close this month, I, and, and I ask them, has the deal entered procurement yet? And it's the 21st of the month, and they say no, we can't let them forecast that deal this month. And so you could say the same kind of thing about legal and the length of time it takes in legal to go back and forth with MSA. Uh, to some extent, it's dependent on whether or not you're an approved vendor and the process that that may take. So I, I think, the, the, again, the fast answer is there are, there, are very, there are numbers that you should be looking at every single month, calls, meetings, demos, proposals, um, you know, opportunities, proposals. But I think perhaps the more important numbers are the numbers that your sales ops person might deliver to you, just looking backward at how long it takes to go from procurement to close or legal to close. Uh, that will help guide the forecast. Maybe we'll go, I think, two more questions. We have time for that. Do you want to pick somebody? I'm going to stay away from that guy. Uh, Neil. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Um, so we work for an SMB lender, and uh, we made the decision to open a telemarketing department a year ago. Um, when we look back at our team, everyone pretty much falls into three categories. One is outperformers, doing well, getting promoted, maybe sales management. Uh, the second group is young people, still learning, still very hungry, you know, really easy to motivate. Um, the third group is the quote-unquote, I don't want to use the word average, but let's call it people that are hitting quota, doing well enough that they shouldn't be performanced out, but not doing well enough to create opportunities for advancement. Um, this group is posing the biggest challenges motivation-wise. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, why aren't they? I'm just, so th thoughts around motivating the mid-tier performance group of sellers. That's exactly right. Have you identified why they're mid-tier? Like, is there something that you can point to to say, this is, you know, why they're underperforming? So let's call it a little bit of motivation, a little bit of work ethic. You know, we stack rank pretty aggressively. So when I say mid-tier, really just mid-tier for a quota, again, they're profitable. There's no reason to performance them out, but they don't create opportunities for advancement for themselves. So it's almost like an endless day that never ends. So they're hitting their numbers. They're hitting, they're hitting their, their quotas. They're doing great, mm -hmm. but they're not exceeding expectations, and so you feel they're kind of stuck. Yes. I would ask you the question, are they stuck? Or are, are you just, if, if, so what I'm hearing you say is that these are, this is a, a cohort of people who are achieving their target, right? but you're concerned that they don't want more than that. So I guess the concern is with our company culture is that we promote top performers to managers, even to higher paying uh, departments, but in every sales organization, you're gonna have the mid-tier group. Um, and the mid-tier group, maybe they don't create these opportunities because they won't fall in that top ranking. We can throw more training at them, we can do whatever we need to, but in the end, they're just a mid-tier player. Long term, how do you motivate someone like that where, again, they are in some ways a little bit stuck? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard. And I, and I think I would say, just in answer to the question, because I think it's important that everyone thinks this way as a manager, I think you've got to figure out what will motivate the human being, right? Management is three-dimensional. And what works for one may not work for another. Uh, and so I don't know that there's a generic way that you can motivate a class of people, um, I think you've got to figure out what inspires the individual. What, what, what is it they're working for, this particular person? Um, you can go really short term and, and ask them about sort of what gets them up in the morning, what drives them, what, you know, what are they using the money that they make at your company for? Um, where do they want to go for here, from here? Um, is, is, is a sort of career pathing something that you could do with them? Maybe they want to stay an individual contributor for the rest of their lives. 
Um, you know, I've had people work for me who are you know, well into their 50s and extraordinarily successful sales professionals who just never wanted to go into management. Um, so that's okay too. I, I guess the point is, is that I think, you know, without, you know, unfortunately I don't think it's a great answer to your question, but my answer is I would spend time with each person individually and understand what motivates this person, um, what drives them. You know, one of the questions that I'll ask uh, a reference before I hire someone is how do I get the most out of this person? Uh, how do I motivate them when, when times are tough? Uh, and so getting that from the individual is probably a really good idea. Um, the other thing I, I would say, and, and I, 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 I think a lot about this when I'm, when I'm hiring SDRs, and it's a mistake that I've made in the past when I've hired sales development reps. Um, people call them BDRs, SDRs. Uh, SDRs are very difficult to motivate if they don't want a career in sales. It's a really tough job to be on the phone all day, every day, scheduling meetings for AEs, where all of the credit goes to the AE, all of the money goes to the AE. It's kind of like a thankless job. It's an important job. It's the foundation upon which everything else gets built. And SDRs are the future of your business, right? They become your SMB and mid-market and enterprise sellers. But it's a, it's a bitch of a job. And the truth is you can't motivate an SDR unless they desperately want a career in sales. And I've hired SDRs who come from great schools and are really smart and can articulate value, can have as an intelligent a conversation peer to peer almost with your prospect as you can, but ultimately they wanna be in strategy or they wanna be in marketing or they wanna be in some other department. And so when, they get, when the day gets long and monotonous and they're on that 50th call, uh, and they don't want to do it anymore, they're really tough to motivate. So it's a long answer, but, but I guess the point is you've got to hire the right people who want a career in the pathway that you're delivering to them uh, and make sure that you're motivating them in the way that they want to be motivated. Thank you. Seems like we've got a couple more questions. We want to keep going and go for some more questions and try and get a yeah. read from the audience. Come on. Yeah, okay, great. Why don't we call on somebody else? So Kiva, I, I really, if what you said about um, memorizing response, like to go and do rehearsals before you meet with um, the prospective buyer and doing a demo, it really resonates with me. So one thing that a lot of research shows that is that in sales, things are really automatic, right? So if someone says something to you, it's responsive, you have to really know it. And with, with most salespeople, you don't know if they're going to be successful until six months to 12 months out. And what happens during that time is learning. So to your to what you were saying was, is just getting people to practice. So, and you also talked about uh, having the, the you know, Navy SEAL you know, two-week training. How do you incorporate and get your um, teams to be energized enough to bring it home and practice hard? outside of those two weeks? Like how do you incorporate that in the, in the culture? Because like deliberate practice, which is a lot of things that Angela Duckworth mm -hmm. shows increases performance, it's really, really hard. It's not just having the two weeks. It's that what you do every Friday or every Saturday to really understand who you're selling to, what you're selling, and the objections that happen in an instant. It's an awesome, oh, sorry. It's a great question. I'm gonna try and synthesize it. <laughs> Sales choreography is great. Sales training in the beginning is fantastic. But six months in, how do you continue to motivate a seller to focus on the practice, which is the focus of their craft, which will make them successful after the training period is over? Yeah. Okay. It's about hiring. You've got to hire people who want that. Well, let me back up. It's actually first about building your brand. Uh, I think if you, you build a brand um, that is aspirational in terms of the employees that, that potentially you want to hire, um, people want to work for your company. Uh, if you build a personal brand, uh, somebody that you know, people want to work for, um, people will, will do the hard work for you. Uh, and then it kind of goes back to the question that Neil asked, I think, about, um, about motivation. Like, what, what will it take to motivate this person? Like, what do they ultimately want in their career? Um, you know, every, I, I don't know who's seen, what's the movie with the, with the it's a, the drumming? Uh, 
Drum, no, not Drumline. Um, <laughs> Whiplash. Right, which is a really fucked up movie, if you've seen it. Um, Whiplash is about perfecting your craft. And I think the, the most successful, forget about sales, the most successful business professionals care that deeply about perfecting their craft. And so I think it's less about getting to the six month mark and trying to figure out how do I continue to motivate this person to take, you know, to, to keep practicing. It's making sure that the people that you hire have done that before. And so there are a lot of analogies that you can look to, you know, you can look to uh, sports or, or music or other areas where this person might have excelled and you know, had to go above and beyond in terms of practicing to get to a place that made them an expert. Um, but these are leading indicators of someone who will continue to do that with you. Uh, that's, that's probably kind of where, where I would say you need to go is back to the beginning, uh, which is actually a question that, that you didn't ask that, that I, I wanted to answer, and that's really about negotiating and closing and overcoming those late objections. It's sort of the same thing about you reaching the six or 10 month mark and realizing this person is difficult to motivate. Well, you had your chance in the first two weeks. It's sort of like the end of a sales cycle when the person says, man, nah, this is not such a high priority for me, or, oh my God, it's too expensive, or it's something that we're gonna do, but we're not gonna do yet. I would say, how do you overcome that objection? Well, you kinda can't. You lost your chance. You should have dug that out during discovery. Uh, because you should be preparing for the inevitable fight at the end of the sales cycle. Um, and so probably not the perfect answer to your question, but I would say that person is, is tough to motivate if it doesn't come from inside. We're gonna do one last question and then wrap up. And then as many of you know, we're hanging around afterwards. Kiva's gonna stay here as well so we can meet and chat, grab more food. Jess Kirk. Okay, cool. so, um, You've worked at privately held companies that are very on the down low, very quiet about what they do, not too much outside marketing. And you've worked at companies that have been very out there with marketing, taxi choppers. Talk, I imagine some people here are in the quieter companies because they're in early stage, is that right? Basically a lot of people, or just a lot of people have marketing too? Both. But can you talk about like the difference between how you run your sales team when they really have that kind of, it's all a secret, you gotta talk to us kind of marketing, or there's really like stuff out there that can feed you leads. So I can talk about both. So what is, what is the difference between working for a company that is out there with a big marketing megaphone and a company that doesn't have a lot of information out there and is a little bit more secretive about what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, the first thing I'd say is uh, the one with the taxi top is a hell of a lot easier than the one without. Uh, get, getting inbound leads and, and responding to those inbound leads is like someone walking into your store and saying, I'm interested in purchasing your product. Uh, if you can't close that person, you shouldn't be in sales. Uh, the other is a lot harder. But I would say, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot away from the question for a second because I think this is important. I think you've gotta tell a great story. Uh, and so I would say, you asked me at the beginning about Handshake and I didn't go into great detail and I won't hear, but what I said was, who wouldn't jump at the chance to work for a company that's revolutionizing an industry, that's transforming an entire industry? Um, and I believe that's what Handshake is doing uh, as you think about the wholesale to retail sales environment that is antiquated. Uh, but I would say the same thing about Gerson Lehrman Group, GLG, where I, where I worked for six or seven years. Um, GLG was transforming the way people learn, right, by giving you access to expertise that you didn't have before. So think about it. You're an executive that's trying to make a difficult business decision, taking your business into China. Now you have this opportunity to talk to an expert who's taken many businesses into China before you make that decision. Who wouldn't jump at that chance? Of course you would. Then I worked for Percolate, right? And Percolate was a marketing technology, or is a marketing technology company, enabling a marketer from the community manager up to the CMO to perform any marketing task inside of a platform, giving a chief marketing officer the opportunity to, like never before, describe to their board 
how each of their brands are performing in each of their markets on each of their channels, transforming the way marketing is done. And now I work for Handshake. And so my guess is that if you just think hard enough, you can probably come up with a pretty good case for how your company is transforming or revolutionizing the industry that you're in. And so I don't know that's a perfect answer to your question, but I would say that's what you want to go to market with. That's the punch in the face that you want to deliver to a prospect when you walk in the door. Because you can always peel off that and explain how. Right? And what you're selling them today can be a vision for where you're going. It doesn't have to include, you don't have to have in your product all of the features that make that revolutionary today. But if you establish yourself as an expert, if you establish yourself as a consultant who this, who this company wants to spend some time with, then you're given the right to guide them over the next 12, 24, 36 months. And that's, that's true enterprise selling. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, thank you, Kiva, for coming out tonight. Uh, I also wanna thank all of you guys for coming out. Um, there's some pretty amazing people here, some new folks uh, who I've met earlier tonight and some folks that have been supporting us for a long, long time. So thanks everyone in the sales community in New York. Um, yeah, yeah, give yourself you. a hand. I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Archie.io, Scaled, Closer IQ, Drizzly, and Cater to Me. If you haven't already, grab some food, grab a drink. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, this will all be available at buildingthesalesmachine.com. And I also want to let everybody know and invite you guys to come out uh, July 27th, where we'll be joined by the CRO of Greenhouse, the applicant tracking software. So that should be another fun event. We're gonna hang out for a while. Kiva's gonna be here, uh, and I look forward to meeting some of you in person. And also a quick reminder, we're looking for a community uh, and social manager for building the sales machine. So if anyone's interested, or anyone wants to help meet everyone in the New York sales community, this is a great gig. So thank you all, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys at the next event. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. That was great. Nice.